Oseo. Oseo. Good Cherokee greeting. This talk that I'm doing is sort of stemming from the past three months, starting with Woman's Herstory Month, and then going into Earth Week, Earth Day, and Earth Month. And then we're coming on through that. And I've been doing the theme of water, you know, like from Earth to water. Something like 75% of the Earth is water, they say. Like that. So that's what I'm continuing along with. <laughs> and to start that off with, we'll go right over here. Look over here. This is Claudia Pocock's painting, another exquisite painting. Uh, what's being featured there, you see a figure. Um, this is known locally there as the Stone Mother. And she's shedding a tear. Um, uh, that's Pyramid Lake, and that is if her tears are going to fill up the lake. So that's that's the actual piece there in front of her is the uh, figure for the pyramid. Lovely painting. And then up here on my shield you see another version of the pyramid. Now the pyramid was named that because John C. Fremont, when he saw it, the sun was shining on it in such a way, it reminded him of the pyramid of Cheops in Egypt, where he had seen that. So that's how it got its name. Uh, it's evident that people from the ancient Mediterranean were here at Pyramid Lake a long time ago. It's a freshwater lake, and uh, it is reputed to be the most ancient, if I can say the ancient or the oldest water on earth. It was once a huge, huge lake, practically an inland sea called Lake Lahontan. And this is, Pyramid Lake is what remains of it. So it's a freshwater lake. And to the people from the Mediterranean, namely the Greeks, this would be Mikus. And the pyramid there actually figures in the Greek perspective as the navel, the navel of the earth. Now, the human navel is really concave like that. So how is this, that is um, convex, how is that a navel? Because a woman, pregnant woman at the end of her term, her navel is protruded out like that. And the baby that she gives birth to for a few days also has a protruding navel. So this is a symbolic of fertility and birth. That kind of thing is the way that it figures in there. And down below the painting, here is a sculpture of a horse's head. This is Claudia's sculpture. It's a stoneware. And this brings my theme to the fore. My theme is both water and horse, and a particular horse for one will be the um, winged horse, the flying horse, usually known as Pegasus. So I'll kind of start with that. Uh, Pegasus is the offspring of uh, Demeter and Poseidon, you know, in the simple way of putting the myth there. The name uh, Pegasus it comes from the Greek word Pege meaning spring, springs, and so that initiates it in terms of uh, water, kind of water that comes from the earth. Now if we go over here and just look at this piece right here, this is a way of, of starting it here. Uh, Pegasus goes to this place, this, this mountain, Mount Hedekon, and he stamps his foot, and when he stamps his foot, water spurts out, and that's what I have here. And then this miniature amphora, you know, with little water, water snakes on it, and all of that. So that's pretty much the, the standard version. Mount Helicon, Helicon, that the word itself, you know, would mean human, but Heleos is also a poetic word for water. Also, perhaps an earlier version of this is actually the mother of Pegasus, you know, 
and collectively known as Demeter. But here, this was her foot here, and in this, then she is known as Lesepi. Lesepi is the mare, the uh, horse goddess herself. That she she stopped and the water came out. What we have going on here all the time in Greece is a change from a totally female orientated culture or cultures there we call it generally because a matriarchy great goddess and that sort of thing uh, but another ideology started infiltrating in there and in this particular perspective we would say it's the Achaeans they have come in from the north and they are bearing a quote father god Zeus and gradually gradually that starts to change everything so you have a lot of doubles in this uh, like that. So at this point I want to want to say <coughs> that after my uh, college I had you know seven years of uh, art history for my MFA and in that I had also had wonderful lessons from Dr. Piotrowski on the ancient art history of the Mediterranean. And so when I Finished with my MFA, I did a teaching at Columbia Community College for a year, and then Claudia and I moved to Arizona. We moved to Tempe, Arizona. And now I really had an opportunity to recollect in my education. Just down the street from us, there was a little bookstore that was very, very good. And um, I was able to go through all the books that I had had in college. At the same time, I know that we are in Tempe, and Tempe is a very important place in ancient Greece, which is sort of the subject that's going on here in my talk. Uh, Tempe is a distance north of Delphi in northwestern Attica, and this Tempe Valley was very idyllic, and this is the origin of the development of we kind of call him here the god Apollo. So Apollo evolved from Tempe and eventually, you know, ended up, let's say, merged into the uh, oracle of Delphi. So the the oracle, well, they start off like that. Uh, the, uh, theos pretty much, you know, means, means God or divinity, and we have still in our language, you know, theosophy, or somebody's name, Theodora, so theology, all of that is the, the Greek rendering there. Uh, for the female, it's Thea. Thea is the oracle of Delphi. She doesn't speak, she doesn't hide, she shows by signs. That's a quote from Heraclitus. The form of Delphi that is the most famous of all the clefts in the whole country of Greece owed its name to this mythic, mythical uh, image, and that is Delphi. Delphi is, signifies the female generative organ. So we have the, this femaleness that continues in it, even though as Apollo begins to evolve, he evolves much more into a sort of sun god. And that, so that we have that going on in this. So there are several oracles, but this was one of the most famous of the oracles. And if I go up here to, this is my drawing here. And this drawing I can call uh, Epona. Epona is really the uh, Celtic rendering of the name for her, Ipo. Um, and that at the same time, I'm ha figuring her in the appearance of an oracle. Um, here she is, the oracle, a as the mare-headed goddess, Demeter. And here she's holding the bird, and there is the oak tree as the, uh, the oracle tree, we you call him, the divine oracle tree. So that's what I have going on here in this. And uh, below that here is my painting, a replication actually, of Pegasus. So 
again, the name pagan, everybody's heard the word pagan, where does that come from? It comes actually from a community on the very, um, I would say, northeast part of what is now Italy, on the Adriatic Sea there. Um, this idea of a spring, a spring you know, shooting out. <clears throat> so the people who surrounded, the community that surrounded this particular spring, actually uh, named themselves after Pegasus, and pagans. And for some reason, uh, the Christians, you know, started eventually, long time, uh, somehow uh, persecuted that and kind of turned it into something else. But that's basically where that, that word pagan has come from, cognate with Pegasus, which again comes from spring, you know, spring. So there where uh, Pegasus, you know, stamped his foot or his mother, Alyssa Hippie, uh, stamped her foot, that became the uh, the hippo, hippocrine. The word hippo or hippo without the aspirin all is horse. It all means horse. So we have different renderings of that. Curiously, it was recorded when the Celts, you know, came down into this area, into Delphi, they used the Celtic word for maras, maras meaning the mare. So then it's very curious that the Latin had picked that up as the mari, like the mari tenebrosium, like the dark sea mari, like that. So the Celts recognized there in Delphi the presence of, yeah, the goddess. So all of these various words, you know, have the, the horse is part of it. Now Poseidon usually figured as, you know, an earth shaker, a titan of the earth <laughs> and so forth. Uh, he has a bit of an, an evolution also, and that he, you know, seems to begin as, quote, you know, a horse god. Actually a horse god. He's credited with bringing the horses from Libya to the Peloponnese. So he's very much figuring that, and then he, in a very later Zeus fashion, couples with Demeter, you know, and Demeter has uh, three children that are all Horses, you know, forget, you know, the golden horse and so forth, I forget all their names, you know. But they are all, uh, figure in, like hippie, hippie, uh, hippie, has that sense of horse in all of it there. So water and horse, and especially um, spring water. Poseidon was both the lord of fresh water as well as salt water. He also seemed to be at some period also figured as a dolphin. So. That's why you have a dolphin here. And before the, uh, these myths and legends and all of these characters, spirits and myths like that, eventually they, they in my study of art history, you see it happen pretty quickly, um, comparatively. They began to be anthropomorphized, began to turn into people. But uh, before they were people, well, a horse, and in the case of Poseidon, a dolphin, and also Apollo. Apollo is a dolphin, and his name seems to uh, suggest that, you know, Apele, uh, seems to be a, a source of his name. So, you know, all down here, I have this figure, since Pegasus is featuring here, for all of this kind of water. So, to have a uh, a spring water to have water in a vessel, you know, like an amphora, um, all these kind of things that figure that. And here you can show this. This is a fountain. A fountain also will be, we'll say, you know, the province of uh, Pegasus. And so we have this all flowing down, and here's Pegasus, and here's a figure of Pegasus. Now, the latitudes, the the uh, achievement or accomplishment of the latitudes was brought about in about the fourth century BC, you know, by Eratosthenes, and that made it possible for these sea people, the Plagisians or the Greeks, you know, to begin to 
create a whole harmony of this part of the world, of the Mediterranean. So that has made it all possible in how water and horse and the alignments figure into that. Last week I was mentioning the island of Rhodes um, as a place that figured, centered in these uh, sacred latitude, <coughs> the sacred parallel that came all the way over here to Turtle Island and even resolves itself here in eastern California at Ridgecrest. Uh, Ridgecrest is at rather the very more or less south end of the Owens Valley. But the whole Owens Valley then continues, you know, in a latitude sense to the country of Greece. And at the very north of that is Pyramid Lake. And that's what, you know, had figured over there as Pyramid Lake, as this freshwater lake. But all of the other senses of water that comes through. Now, here... This, I've replicated this, this is Demeter, or the Hippodamia. The, the name Demeter is actually from her original name, Hippodamia. So, she is known and was known as the horse goddess, or the horse-headed goddess, or the mare, anything to that effect. And this was actually from um, her shrine there in the Peloponnese. Here, I have made an illustration here. This is a vase painting, which is very interesting. Uh, there you can plainly see that there is a woman. Ostensibly, she's actually at a fountain. She's actually at a fountain. And, and the fountain is here, and there is a lion's head that's pouring out water into the amphora. The amphora is also a symbol. Between the two, Leo and the Amphora, we have now entering into the Zodiac. The Zodiac that this is Leo and Aquarius. And these are very, very important. Uh, in about the 8th century BC, the Zodiac had entered in. Once that the Greeks looked at the stars, and the stars were stable, and then they began to join them, the stars and the planets and all of that. And so they kind of began to figure, once they had the, the latitudes uh, and could figure all that, they had a kind of a network so that the zodiac figures came into it. It came into it so much as eventually you could lay the figure of the zodiac like a circle down over the center of Delphi. Delphi would be, you know, the center of the earth, the Omphalos, like that. And all of the ways that these radiate out, like that. So, one of the, again, the symbolism of the female is, you know, a triangle. So, to figure a, a triangulation in this from Delphi all the way south to Crete, Mount Ida, and then from Delphi all the way to Camarillos in Rhodes. That's the importance of my having this water jar here that is from Rhodes. So that is one triangulation, and that triangulation is symbolic for the female. It is almost, uni almost universal. And also from Rhodes, there is a direct line from that latitude straight up through Delos, which is the birthplace of Apollo in the Cyclades Islands, and it goes right on through up to Delphi. So that makes a, a definite relationship of Rhodes to Delphi. Now each of these places has an oracle, an oracle of some kind, some of immense antiquity there. So, again, my illustration here, you know, referring to that as an oracle. And if I can step aside here, can you see this illustration behind me? Uh, this is actually the oracle of the talking tree. And my replication here 
is from the neck of a amphorus um, of 2,700 years ago. So that you can look at that Greek rendering there from so long ago. So back to the relation here of Aquarius and Leo. These are on an axis, and this axis is the sacred spirit of the whole country of Greece. And I'm just putting it, you know, simply. But figured in this is like that. Plus, what I'm reading here modernly, this black line, which of course is, is a column at the fountain, and here's the woman. She's standing the other side of it, and her hands barely reaching through. Now, I'm just giving you like an interpretation that's modern, and that is the zodiac is pre-psychological. The zodiac shows that it is non-psychological. What's happened with the psychology and the, the psychology of the self needs to realize the astrology. The astrology in the sense that I'm referring to it it's like, it's like a gift. It's like a gift that's come from the Oracle of Delphi, we'll put it that way, you know, for people. So not to be, you know, enmeshed or caught up with the psychology of the self, okay, put it, putting it that way. So that's the way that I'm figuring here with the woman and she's barely reaching through the barrier to this really cosmic axis of the ancient Mediterranean. So that's a simple way of putting, putting that. Here, if we look at this here, this is a petroglyph. This petroglyph is in a cave, there's actually a series of caves in Oklahoma off the Arkansas River. And it's a Celtic petroglyph, and I've just done Strictly the image of her, the piece itself is is probably this this tall, mine's in miniature, and it is figured as Epona. Epona is the Celtic way of speaking of the horse goddess. The horse goddess again is actually Demeter, there, and there is very extensive inscription here. Now the nature of this inscription is all written in dots, like Braille, called Bryson, there. And there is actually some figure of a star here, and so it does say that's, that's what she's doing. She's contemplating the stars. Now that's very significant in this perspective that the ancient people of the Mediterranean viewed the stars as stable, and that, that this stability if they could generate that universally in that world, would bring about a harmonious society, a harmonious nation. There was, up until Alexander, there was no authority. There was nobody, you know, who was over everybody else kind of thing. It was all equal. Uh, later, you have the Macedonians under um, Alexander. Uh, then he became a god and it kind of merged with the father god and everything that came out of that. But here in this um, petroglyph, this is uh, Epona, uh, Demeter, sitting on her horse. It's also very interesting because these lines here show that the engraver was familiar with an illustration or illustrations <coughs> in the world at that time that, you know, very graphically would show Demeter riding on a horse, kind of side saddle, so these would be her skirt, you know, the lines of her skirt coming over. And all of this in the inscription is saying that this is the time of the Sabin, you know, the end of October, and the onset of winter. So even one of the figures that's very catchy of Scorpio almost looks like a little airplane, like that. But then what happens with, with the people who have investigated this, uh, right on the eve of something, a light comes and lights up her, her head. 
And it's no accident that this is the shape of a triangle and her head is in the shape of a triangle, which denotes wow, that she's a goddess there. So now this is in Oklahoma. Also in the cave, there is also a graving made much the same way of Pegasus. You know, Pegasus in, in, in the wings sticking up like that. But it's not necessary for me to replicate that because it would be looking something like this. Now, come down here to, I have another horse here. And I'm speaking of horses in all of this. Uh, this stands for uh, Gemini and Sagittarius. They are both uh, horse signs in the, in the zodiac. So that's all this. I'm showing how much of the horse is in this theme of uh, the zodiac, of water, and throughout uh, the ancient Greek world. We come down here and you can look at this figure here. Now, this is a votive bronze. Now, these votives, like even today, especially in Mexico, people have little uh, images of things that they put in the church, they paint them up or put them on something, you know, called milagros. So, in the ancient world, pretty much the same thing. And so, this one's very interesting as it really shows, you know, characteristic in the style of an ancient Greek horse, you know, it has some kind of uh, signs imprinted in it, you know, and that would be um, a boat of bronze is the way I would, I would word that there. Also up here, everybody would recognize up here that this is a seahorse is what we call them. That's a hippocampus, the hippocampus. Now, again, in this very water-conscious world, um, the nirids. The nirids are nymphs that obviously live in the water and they can be imagined in this way. And the father or the king of the nirids, nirus, well that's what he rides on. He, he, ride, he rides on one of these. In the art, pretty much the seahorse in that case is figured like the front part of a horse, you know, the head of a horse and the feet of the horse and the, re the rest of it more like a fish. So uh, the nirids are also um, sea nymphs, <laughs> water nymphs in that. And even back to Mount Helicon where Lysippi or Pegasus, you know, stamps his feet, um, there that becomes the font of the muses. That's what it's known as the muses. And all, it, all this is just a sketch to show how in the ancient world a way was found, you know, to harmonize, to harmonize all of that ancient world. Uh, there was very little real strife. These strifes usually came, were coming from people coming in to that world, like mainly naming the Achaeans. And it's very visible the way that the orientation or ideology of the Achaeans with the Father God and also the institution of rape came about. You know, through mm -hmm. Zeus, through Poseidon, all of these were mythical, but it did in that way uh, institutionalize rape. And more and more, the male God, we'll call him that, supplanted the female. The last phase of the Mediterranean of, the, of this uh, mother culture that I studied in college was called the palace cultures. And these palace cultures were mainly survived on the islands longer than they did on any mainland. Uh, there was other ways of alluding to it, um, uh, what do you call Hel Helen of Troy, that, and that she was abducted or eloped you know, with Paris to Troy and that started the whole war. Really she's the moon goddess who circulated through all of these shrines all the way through uh, down to Crete and all, all the way around all the way up to Troy that she was reigniting. So we began to uh, be able to see the difference of the earlier 
and the, the persistence of it and how something else had come in and supplanted, took over, or even changed the, the themes and, and the names of what was relevant with anything, uh, the female, in that way. So uh, that's why, it is, to me, it's very important to you know, renew this, revive this, you know, be aware of this to know the way it has come about. You know, James Hillman, a Jungian psychologist, had written that ancient Greece is our soulscape. So I think that's a very good way to be able to reckon with that. The, the figures that have come th down through us, Aristotle and Homer and Hesiod, uh, have given us really good clues. So when we are familiar with these, these things, we can see the way that the different parts begin to fit in. And again, I'm saying my basis is art history, and I'm an artist, and so I can replicate all of these things, you know, to, to show that. Because the art history, just looking at statues and pictures, you know, isn't enough. You want to know you know, why they made them, how that they came about, and what do they represent or, or figure. So it's, it's a whole thing, kind of putting it that way. And that's the way I've been carrying this out. So if we understand that all of these figures, even the ruins that are still uh, recognizable, I mean, people can find the ruins in the, in the ancient Mediterranean, in order to see that what the ancient people were doing, they were making a mirror of the heaven. They were making a mirror of the heaven because the heaven is stable. And that as far as everybody, the population, and there's many islands, many islands, and they all have different views, but there was enough of, of something that was coherent that more or less everybody was together with it. So all of that until conflict, you know, entered into that world was relatively good. It was relatively harmonious. And it's really a, a way for us to recall, you know, that human world. And so that is very much um, the way I feel in presenting this theme and what I can contribute to it at this time. Now, Mary Oliver, my favorite co-partner here, <laughs> here she does have something with the Greeks. And so I'll do this poem, and she has titled it, Deer in the Meadow. Wind and rain, then it grows colder, ice gathers on the wire founding the empty field. Then six deer walk from under the dark pines, their heads high, their eyes soft and alert, their legs fragile, seeming, though they are not fragile. Inside the house it is warm and cozy. In the Iliad, which I have been reading, Achilles has just refused to put on his beautiful armor. Yet he has said that his friend Patroclus might wear it. And now he is watching his darling as he straps the elaborate heavy armor over his gleaming body. Just as though there was a way to do something in this world and be by the gods unnoticed. Patroclus will not come back from the long days fighting. Rash and sorry, prideful and angry, Achilles will swirl and swirl like the wind. It comes to nothing but a brave story. You would think the deer would go back to the thick pines, but still they stand in the field, gazing and gazing. See how their beautiful bodies darken and tremble. See the white rain come down over their eyes. 
see how it makes light of all of it.